Hi, and welcome to another episode of Raising the Volume. My name is Charlton Singleton. I'm the artist in residence emeritus here at the Gilliard Center. And today we have uh, yet another distinguished guest. We have with us Dr. Bernard Powers, who is uh, an, uh, just a really, really grand, grand person in our community. Uh, he is a professor emeritus at the College of Charleston and uh, so many uh, fabulous things that he does and, and studies and lectures on that we're going to talk about today. So welcome to Raising the Volume, sir. Thank you. Glad yes. to be here. Uh, this has been a long time in the making. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad we could sync our schedules. De definitely, <laughs> definitely. So now I usually like to start off our conversations with just getting a little uh, background. Sure. Um, where are you from originally? Yeah, so uh, Charlton, I'm originally from Chicago. Ah, yeah, yeah. windy. Yeah, yeah. Born, born and raised there. That's right, the yeah. windy city. Mm -hmm. Windy city. Okay. So, yeah. now, um, did you come from a large family? Uh, no, a actually, my nuclear family, just my parents and my brother and okay. I. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just the four of us. Now, my extended family is is pretty large, uh, but over the years, I haven't I haven't been really that close to my my cousins, for example, and we're distributed around the, the country. Okay, yeah, yeah. Don't really have a chance to interact with them very much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, but my parents, my brother, we're, we're all very close. All right. And you, um, throughout your early years of schooling, it was all in, in, in Chicago? Yes. Uh, uh, the early years. And then uh, when I went to college, I went to college in Minnesota. Uh, attended a small Lutheran school uh, by the name of Gustavus Adolphus. Gustavus Adolphus was one of the kings of Sweden. Okay. Uh, and so um, I knew uh, someone who attended that school and ended up uh, going myself and finishing my undergraduate work there. First time that I had ever been in Minnesota. Okay. So, yeah. And, uh, in fact, my... Uh, my old roommate from college still lives up there, okay. and he was he was originally from New Orleans, and uh, he's he has been back to New Orleans very few times since he moved up Minnesota. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So now, growing up in Chicago, um, when you were that uh, when you know just growing up in Chicago, yeah. Um, yeah. Were you and your family, your your brother and your 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 parents? Um, very active in any um, uh, any of the uh, you know political action or anything that was happening during yeah. that time. Uh, let's see, my parent my parents weren't weren't particularly uh, aggressively active in in political organizations. Uh, we did go to some uh, civil rights kinds of meetings and right. demonstrations, that kind of thing. Uh, so, so, for example, when uh, Dr. King was in Chicago in, I believe, it's 1966, and there the objective was marching for open housing and protesting against uh, racial discrimination right. in in loans, homeowner loans, and that kind of thing, mortgages, and so on. And there were there were several, there were many demonstrations over on the uh, the southwest side of the city of Chicago, um, and big rallies downtown. For example, at Soldiers Field. And uh, let's see, I was I was not there with my parents, but with with some friends. Uh, we gathered and heard Dr. King in the Soldier Field area when those demonstrations were going on. I think the year was 1966. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my my parents were mainly involved in the church. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which which meant that uh, my younger brother and myself also spent a lot of time in church. Of course. Too. Of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. That's how yes. it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't a matter of you choosing. You know, this was this was your destiny. No, no, yeah. no, no. I had yeah. a friend of mine. 
<laughs> he said, I was I was at his house and uh and his father had given him a directive or something and and he said make no mistake about it this yeah. is a dictatorship in this yeah, house yeah yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> right. that's right that's right don't make a mistake and think it's a democracy right not in this house <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right sounds familiar right so, right sounds familiar. right right, sounds familiar. right. <laughs> so when you went to uh college what did you major in yeah. at uh, at college so ac- actually um I I started off as a chemistry major. Wow. You know, when I when I graduated from high school and and this is documented in the Harlan Falcon newspaper. Well, that, you, that's you. the name of my high, high school, school and, and yeah. the newspaper. So uh I was interviewed and, and, and I told the student interviewer that I was gonna major in either chemistry or history because I love both of those subjects. And the summer that I graduated from high school, I got a job in a chemical factory. And uh, in fact, in fact, the um, plant manager told me, he says, well, look, uh, you're going to go to college. You're going to finish your degree in chemistry. And when you finish your degree in chemistry, uh, how about you coming back here and taking a job in the lab? And uh, in the meantime, you can, you can, uh, every summer, come and work here in the plant. I said, well, that, yeah, sure. That, that sounds, sounds like a winner. That's, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> yes. I like chemistry anyway. <clears throat> so, but when I got to college, college chemistry was completely different from high school <laughs> chemistry. Right, right. <laughs> you know, um, and, it, and, it, and it turned almost entirely into, into mathematics, or right. so it seemed, or so it seemed. And then... Um, And there's a certain irony about the story that I'm going to tell you now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you ended up spending so much time in the lab working on the experiments and you'd be there on Saturdays and there was no one else there. It was it was lonely. And and so for for a variety of reasons, I ended up uh, putting putting down chemistry and then gravitating back to my other love, which was history. history. My, my roommate in, in, in college, uh, and he remains one of my dearest friends today, uh, uh, he was a history major. And so he was, he was telling me everything that was going on in history class and about the professors and everything. And so, you know, I said, yeah, you know, I, you know, I really do love history and I ought to Come back to it, and that's and that's what I did. Now, here's here's the irony. Here's the irony. Uh, one of the reasons I I moved away from chemistry was because it felt so impersonal. Uh, you know, in the laboratory, I'm in there by myself, and and you know what I was working on these experiments, just entirely impersonal. Mm-hmm. So, I I recall an event that uh, happened at the University of Chicago. And I was in one of the specialized libraries there. This is when I was a graduate student. And it was around Christmas time. And I, and I went to this, it's really an archive, and I went to this archive probably nine o'clock in the morning as soon as it opened up. And the records that I needed to look at were down in the basement. And so the attendants, they ushered me down in the, in the basement and I went down there. And so I'm, I'm down there all day. And I'm the only person around, you know, down there. And then at about 5 o'clock, the end of the day, I, I came up. And as I'm walking up the stairs, I, I hear this, this noise and people having fun and laughing and joking and everything. And they're having a, a kind of a Christmas party. Uh-huh. And so the number of those people who saw me come in in the morning, they, they looked at me and they said, you're still here. You're still you, <laughs> you've been here all, all day. day. <laughs> you've been down there by yourself. Right. I said, yeah. And they said, hey, come come on over here and have a drink. You know, we're yeah. the Christmas party. <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, I've spent a lot of time in archival collections. Right, right. In libraries mm-hmm. and sections of the library where I'm the only individual, <laughs> <laughs> right? But it's but it's still not the same as being in in, in the, the lab chemistry lab, right? Because at least the subjects that I'm working on 
are individuals. Right. And you come to know them, their quirkiness, the different aspects of their lives in the course of conducting your research right. and so on. But I always remember that irony about yeah. the loneliness of the lab. Well, the archives can be the same way, but, could, yeah. but there are important differences. Yeah. There's, when you, when you're uh, looking through archives um, and um, there's a certain there's a certain um, adventure. There's a certain yes. excitement of chasing. Yes, there you know is. that information. There really, there really is. You know, uh, again, when I when I was a senior in college, my uh, the chairman of the department. Uh, he says, "Well, well, look, uh, Bernard. That, that's how you pronounce <laughs> my name." Oh, okay. He, he says, "Well, look." Um, I'm going to be going to the National Archives in D.C. in January. We had a short January term, and, and, and a lot of travel courses were offered during, during that month. Right. He says, so I'm going to go to D.C., and um, I'm going to take a few students with me working on a research project, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to see the National Archives and, and work on the project with me. And so, you know, I said, oh, yeah, you know, that, that, would, that would really, really be nice. And so I uh, went, went up there at, uh, with uh, Dr. Lund, Donover Lund is his, is his name. And that was, that was my first exposure to real historical research in an archive. And that's, that's pretty good. Your first yeah. archive is, right. is the National Archives of the United States. And Professor mm. Lund told me, he says, Bernard, the historian is like a detective, like a detective. And you search out all of these pieces of information and then put them together to try to tell a convincing story, as well as, you know, to find out what happened, what transpired. And so I never forgot that. And yes, it is, it is, it certainly can be adventurous. Uh, it can be frustrating, as, mm -hmm. as, as you know. Uh, it can be exhilarating, uh, such as one tri another trip that I made to D.C. And I was there for a week, and I'm looking through th this letter collection, and I'm looking for letters written by a specific minister, I had seen some references to these letters in the work of previous scholars. And so I knew that they had been there, and I hoped that they were still there. And as I said, I'd, I'd been there almost a week. Every day, frustration mounting. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I'm s staying in a DC hotel, right. <laughs> the cost is right. mounting. Yeah, right, okay. yeah. uh -huh. But then, Charlton, the last day, and it was only a half day because I, I had to leave by about 1 o'clock to get on my plane, I found the two or three letters that uh -huh. I had been looking for. I was, I, was abs I was so elated, I wanted to shout. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I maintain my right. composure, <laughs> but, but inside I was roiling because yes. I found these letters, yes. made the copies of them, and, you know, and on home to, to plug them into the appropriate spot in, in my work. So, yeah, 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 I've had a number of moments like that, that I had but, a, you know, that have been kind of touch and go until the very end. <laughs> some years ago, um, when um, the Charleston Jazz Orchestra had just started and, mm -hmm. and I had, you know, started this orchestra and um, we were looking for some Duke Ellington music mm -hmm. and um, we were told that um, that uh, some of Duke Ellington's music was at the Smithsonian and it was some of it in his original manuscript, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then we were told that if we you know, were to specifically, you know, say what we were looking for, 
then there were people that could, you know, obviously mm-hmm. go mm-hmm. straight to it or mm-hmm. whatever have mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, I didn't really know anything about about archiving anything yeah, or, yeah, or history yeah, or anything. Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Y- even though the irony of that is my mom was a librarian for many years. Oh, 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 oh okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and my sister for that matter. <laughs> okay. You know, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, oh, wow. I was I was chasing this specific piece of music. Yes, and I yeah. remember yeah. not being able to find it, um, you know, on some of these music sites that have mm-hmm. um, people doing arrangements of it, where you can buy it or something. Mm-hmm. I I was saying to myself, well, there's got to be some sort of record. There's somebody yeah, that's got yeah, to have it, yeah, and so yeah, we we yeah, yeah. we ended up with the Smithsonian, yeah. and um, yeah. and sure enough, they they actually sent me. You know this a copy, of course, yes. of of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of Duke Ellington's music, and I yeah. I, I was uh, so um, just taken back by it because yeah. I'm sitting yeah. here saying, you know, I've got manuscript in my hand. Yes. It's a photocopy, but yeah, still, but this still. is I'm looking at Duke Ellington's handwriting. Yes, yes, um, yes. And yeah. uh, I. I <laughs> I put it on the floor and I rolled in it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, this yeah, is Duke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's know? right. That's but right. But yeah, right. it's a, it's an yeah. amazing um it's an amazing feeling to chase something like that. Yeah. And then when you actually yeah, 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 get yeah. to where it is that you you found it or mm-hmm. something, then that makes everything else kind oh, yeah. of Right. Kind of mood that that's it's, right. It's that's right. Tol- tolerable. Right. And, 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 and all of that. It was yeah. all worth it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and the way research is done now has changed a lot now that we have the internet. Oh, definitely. Because you've got so many sources that are available online now. Uh, so you, I mean, you still have to go to archival collections because certain materials are so fragile. Uh, they really uh, can't really ha- handle them in, in, in the ways that are necessary to, to photograph them and put them, put them online, that, kinds of, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, uh, but that, um, that ensures that that allure and that adventure right. will always be there, Correct. you know, too. Correct. Uh, and, uh, you know, to... to, to have a box of letters brought to you. There, mm-hmm. there may be 50 letters in here, and you're opening them up one by one. It's just, and, 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 and you're reading them. I mean, there's something so personal and intimate. Oh, yeah. And intimate about that. Right. Uh, it, is, it is like nothing else. It is, it is like you are in a situation where you are allowed to sit on someone's shoulder and look down on the letter as right. they're composing it. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the difference is, y- you know, perhaps, uh, the larger context, and you have more information. You know what's going to happen down the road right. that, that this person may perhaps have anticipated in the writing, or the outcome might have been completely different. Mm-hmm. Certainly, certainly, if you're reading the letters of someone who, let's say, a uh, Confederate soldier or a white South Carolinian who's writing during the Civil War, well, we know, based on hindsight, uh, what, or, or not hindsight, but the, but the future, uh, what the outcome of the war was. Right. They, they didn't they know. Didn't they had know. their hopes and dreams right. and right. expectations, fears, and so on. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes it quite special. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you finish your undergrad there. Yes. And you, you, you mentioned sort of you went to graduate school up, in, up yeah. there as well? Uh, no, no. Oh. I, I went to uh, uh, graduate school practically back home. At Northwestern University mm-hmm. in Evanston, so right, right outside of Chicago. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then, how did you end up here in yeah, yeah, Charleston? Yeah, in, in Charleston, yes, sure. Um, and and the story is pretty simple. Um, I ended up working on a research project, which which looked at 
the development of Charleston's 19th century black community with a focus on the post-Civil War years. And so that really is how I ended up coming to Charleston for the very first time. And I, I came here for the first time in 1975, and it, it, uh, it would have been right around, right around this time, right around this time. And one of the reasons I remember that is because I came and I did not have a hotel reservation for the first night. Um, and so as a, as a young person, I mean, I would have been about 25. So as, as a young person, I just said, well, that's no problem. When I get there, I'll just get the f first night room and then move to the other uh, hotel, which was the Francis Marion. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I really didn't know Charleston. I didn't know what was going on. Charleston in March and the tourists and the mm. gardens. <laughs> and, <laughs> and every place I went to, they looked at me like, what? Are you kidding? We don't have any, we don't have any rooms at all. And so I might have ended up s staying over in Marion Square on a park bench that night. Oh. Uh, which obviously wouldn't have been too good. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and you know something? I can't remember right now the, the hotel that I stayed in mm. that night, but I did finally manage to, to get one. Uh, the other thing that happened is that um, uh, once, because the cab driver took me around to several different hotels, and, and once he drove off with my briefcase, in the, in the car, and I had to have the desk clerk at the hotel that I, that I was at call him back. I mm -hmm. says, hey, you know, I'm not finished here, and you that's got right. my briefcase. You got my yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, that's, so that's how I got to Charleston uh, the very first time, 1975. I was only here for maybe about five days because I, um, I was going around to the, the various libraries, the, the um, county library, and... Uh, the uh, Historical Society, for example, checking out some of the records that were available and making the arrangements. And then the next year, uh, th the late spring and summer of 1976 and the fall. So, you know, I came back and I was in Charleston for about five or six months and then mm. uh, up, at, up in uh, Columbia for a month. Mm -hmm. And so that was the longest expansive time that I, that, uh, that I spent here before my wife and I moved here in 1992. So, um, in fact, when I, when I came back in 76, I, I drove then because I knew I was going to need a car and, and everything. And the one thing that I'll never forget is I got off of I-26, Upper uh, Meeting Street, and there is a timeless place that was there then, and it is still, still there, there now. now. Church's chicken. Oh yeah, <laughs> that church's yes. chicken. That church's yes. chicken is right there. I yes. remember it. I said, "Boy, this looks like home." <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has stood the test yeah, of time. It, it, yes, it has. It, yes, it has. Yes, it has. And yes. so, and so, you know, um, when people come and visit. And we're over in that area. I, I tell them, I said, now, I don't know when that church's chicken went in there. But I can tell you, it was there in 1976. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, you Definitely know, the other, the other thing uh, that, that I'll always remember, too, is because, because, you know, I'm from Chicago. Where they tear down the buildings and put up glass and concrete and steel buildings. Uh, <coughs> and, and Charleston was such a, it made such a deep impression on me. And, and when I came to the city for the first time and, and downtown, there, there were a number of buildings that showed fire damage and there were some, there were a number of dilapidated buildings downtown. And I remember thinking to myself, particularly the buildings that showed fire damage, thinking, are 
are some of those buildings from the Civil War? Is some <laughs> of that damage? <laughs> you know, I'm still wondering <laughs> about that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it was it was quite a culture shock. Oh, yeah, it's a, and a yeah. yes, and a shift. It's a big city. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 here's the other thing. And and so I was here for about five months. I stayed up at the. Um, it was then known as the um, the Darlington Apartments, the Floyd Manor Center. Yeah. Now, I stayed up there because I could rent an apartment right. on a monthly basis. Right. And there were real problems up there then. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, That's always been a landmark. Yeah. That and, oh, yeah. and I remember growing up it was that and um there was the Coca Cola plant. Oh yeah. That yeah. was there and they had the yeah. big Coca Cola sign yeah. that was yeah. kind of near all of yeah. that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, That's when right. You, when, the, you, yeah. when you drove on the interstate mm -hmm. and you saw the building and, and right there next to yep. it. Those yep. were yep. always landmarks for yep. me growing yep. up. Yep. Yeah, yep. yep. exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. And the uh the Darlington Apartments, the tallest building right. in the upper part of the, the city, the right. lower part of the city. So uh, let's see. I was going to uh, tell you tell you something about um, about that place. That uh, well, well, maybe it was just that I that you, you know stayed I stayed there. there. Yeah, yeah, I stayed there. So oh uh, yeah, I was going to tell you though. So I was here for five months in in Charleston, and I mean. I just fell in love with Charleston. Huh. I mean, uh, before coming, it was a subject of study uh, in a classroom, in an archive, a library. You did seminar paper on this subject or that subject related to it. But then you come here and you see it, and then you meet people, and you meet people. Uh, it took on a whole new dimension for 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 my life actually and so by this time i'm 26 26 years old and 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 i reached this conclusion i said when i retire i'm going to retire in charleston yeah now, how, how many people at 25, <laughs> yeah. 26, they're even thinking about retirement <laughs> right. you know, at all? Right. You know? Yeah, but that's, that was a decision that, that I made at mm -hmm. that point. I mean, I, I just love the play. The, the look, the feel, the people, uh, the history that was so alive as you walked up and down the streets. Mm -hmm. And so, so... That's that's really, I guess, a long story about how we got how to we Charleston. got to right. Charleston. So when in, did in, in 1992 we came 1992. We we moved here in 1992. Now now my wife and I had come uh, several several times, but uh, between the mid 80s, probably probably yeah maybe about four times the mid eight between the mid 80s and and 92. Yeah, so when did you then start working at the College of Charleston? Uh, ninety two. Okay. So so that's that's why I I came in ninety two to take uh, a job over uh, there. I see. And um, uh, Lee Drago, who was on the faculty there at the college, he's since retired, uh, was familiar with some of my work because uh, we had met one another at conferences, mm -hmm. and uh, he had he had done some some work on reconstruction political leaders in Georgia. But at this time, he was completing his history of the Avery Institute. And so Lee was familiar with my work, and we talked. And I found out about the position at the college. So I went to my wife, Lorraine, mm -hmm. and I said, well, look, there's this and you know why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know why. So, <laughs> I don't have to say anything else, right? <laughs> and so uh, I said, there's, there's this position, and you've been to Charleston, you know what it's like, but there's no need in me going through the trouble of applying if, if you're not interested right. at all. Right. So, so let's think about it and let, and let me know. And she was at a point in her career when she was interested in making a change also. 
And so, so uh, as it turns out, the college and I were mutually attracted to mm -hmm. one another. And so the fall of 92 was the first semester that I started teaching there. Now, you mentioned Avery. Yeah. Um, and um, just for our, our, our viewers that might not know mm -hmm. a lot about Avery, can you tell us a little bit about sure. what Avery is and yeah. what your involvement has been with Avery yeah. over the years? Yeah, sure, sure. So Avery um, was one of the first schools for African Americans in the city of Charleston immediately following the Civil War, and certainly the grandest uh, and uh, the most sophisticated mm -hmm. school for for black students in Charleston uh, following the American Civil War um, really begins in uh, 1865, I believe, and the building dates to 1868. Um, uh, uh, and so it provided a wonderful educational opportunity for uh, the time that it existed and, and, and it continued to exist until the middle, middle 1950s here in the city. And, and the thing about, Charles, uh, about uh, Avery is that <clears throat> until, until uh, Burke High School was built, there was no public high school for African American students in Charleston. In the whole county of Charleston. In the whole county. In the whole county. There, there, was, there was no high school. And see, see, Avery was, from the very beginning, the equivalent of a high school. Uh, it, was, it had, you know, the lower grades, but it also had the college preparatory curriculum. And so a lot of people who finished Avery then went on to various colleges like Howard University and Fisk University mm -hmm. and, and went on to become uh, professionals and part of the African-American uh, educational uh, elite. And uh, for example, the teachers, uh, Avery was uh, classified as what was called a normal school Avery too. normal. Mm -hmm. Avery normal school. And uh, that meant that it, it had the teacher preparatory curriculum. And so, so many of the black teachers in Charleston County and, and, and many other places did their work at, at Avery and, uh, and then staffed school positions all around, uh, you know, in various places. So uh, Avery is a, quite a storied and important institution. Just to interject something really yeah. quick. Um, I often throw Avery out there um, when I talk to, to uh, students and people about um, Jenkins Orphanage mm -hmm. because uh, um, there were two gentlemen that came from Avery, they had just graduated from Avery that Reverend Jenkins had hired in order to teach this music class uh -huh. that had then blossomed uh -huh. into the bands and, mm -hmm. and, and that whole mm -hmm. history of, of uh, Jenkins Orphanage yeah. and the bands and yeah. how important it is to jazz, you know. So, um, yeah. so yeah. when people talk about uh, the teacher that came from Avery, mm -hmm. that's a mm -hmm. big subject. That's a, that's oh, a huge to oh do. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And, and just, to, just to take it in... Uh, another direction, you think about Septima Clark. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Student at Avery and then a teacher there and then uses her educational skills to uh, create the Freedom Schools uh, over on Johns Island to mm -hmm. begin with and, and then goes to work for Dr. King and spreads that idea throughout the South. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it comes back to Avery. Comes back, comes to, Avery. back to Avery. So Avery has really been an educational powerhouse. And of course, today it continues as today. It's a part of the, um, the library of the College of Charleston, part of the, uh, that library that focuses on uh, the study of the African-American experience with a focus on, on South Carolina. Um, and it's an archive, archival collection, mm -hmm, a museum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a community resource with public programming and, right. and so still very very valued very vibrant and so we look forward to continuing to work with Avery and and so when I was when I was here um, 
when I was here as a graduate student, and, and even subsequently, uh, I worked on various research projects over at Avery because they had the material that I needed to look at. Um, and one of, uh, one of my, again, dearest friends, and at one point was a, was a colleague before he retired from Avery, Oliver Small. Oh, yeah. There, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Oliver. And, um, you know, I, I remember meeting Oliver, and I met him uh, during one of those research trips before I lived here. And it was Oliver Smalls that introduced me to the, uh, the Black Charleston photograph, photographic collection, which was in, I recall, the special collections of our library. And um, it, had, it, it, it had a variety of, of, of different kind of uh, photos uh, of uh, different aspects of, of black life in Charleston. And I used a number of those in, in my book, Black Charlestonians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so Oliver was very, very helpful in terms of introducing me to that, to that, to that collection. Yeah. Now, you, speaking of books, um, you've, how many books have you... <laughs> Well, <laughs> I've only, I, well, I've, let's see. I have only published one single author. Okay, single book. author, yeah. Okay. Sing, single author monograph on a, on a single subject, mm -hmm. and that's my Black Charlestonians. Black Charlestonians. Black Charlestonians of Social History. And then uh, I worked on uh, We Are Charleston, uh, Tragedy and Triumph at Mother Emanuel which was published in 2016 with my distinguished colleagues, uh, Herb Frazier and Marjorie, Marjorie Wentworth. Wentworth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so the three of us put that together. Uh, we, we wanted to do something bec because you remember what that was like. Everybody mm -hmm. was hurting. Nobody knew what they could do. And we said, well, let's, let's see if we can capture the moment and and tell the world about Emmanuel, the people whose lives were taken, what they were like, and talk about how all of this fits into Charleston, its history, as well as its then present, and how this connected up to the AME Church also. Mm -hmm. So that's how the three of us came together on that project. And, and I, I had I'd known her for a number of years, Oh, yeah. uh, no, and, Good guy. And, and, and he, very, he's very been well. on the show. He's been on yes, this. Yes, 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 yes. I know. I know. Yeah. I know. In fact, I told, I, I told him I'm still following him around. <laughs> he's, he's making a way. I'm following him around. And, uh, and, and I knew Marjorie, yeah. but, but not, not very well. She was an acquaintance. And so now, now the three of us are fast friends. Yeah. So, and then most recently, uh, the end of 2020, last year, uh, I published with USC Press uh, 101 African Americans uh, who made South Carolina. Hmm. But that, that's, and, and there are exactly 101 entries. So it is a small encyclopedic collection of, of people, black Carolinians, who in a variety of ways did things uh, in politics, in sports, in literature, uh, in religion, across the board to make the South Carolina that we know today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's an edited collection of, of vignettes. And uh, a, a number of those, in fact, most of them are drawn from the... Um, Walter Edgar's Encyclopedia of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I, I was the Afro-Am editor for that collection. And so we, so we pulled a lot of those entries out, um, updated them, and then republished them in the 101. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so, so that's how that's how that one came up. And so, so the thing is, if if let's say one is interested in learning more about individuals who shaped South Carolina history, 
that book, which is, well, I'll just say, it's about that thick compared to the encyclopedia. Right, right. It's, yeah. thick. <laughs> it's much more accessible. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, yeah. I spend a lot of time um, in classrooms. Um, yeah. Well, nowadays via Zoom or, or something yeah, like that. Right, but right, um, right, right, but right. prior to the pandemic, I would um, go out to a lot of classrooms mm -hmm. and I would be talking to students, um, uh, younger students, usually in the high school and middle school um, grade levels. But I would talk to them about um, a lot of the people that come from South Carolina that they probably mm. may not have, well, because of their age, they probably yes, not yeah. have heard of them. Yeah. But when I tell them about some of the things that they do, mm -hmm. then they, you know, have these, oh my gosh, we do these wow yeah. moments. Um, one time I was, uh, I was sitting with, um, with a dear friend of ours, uh, the late Jack McCray. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And, um, and Jack just sort of, in an mm. odd comment, he just said to me, he said, well, you know, South Carolina is the Mecca. And I said, what? Yeah. And he started yeah. just talking about some of the yeah. people, um, being that I'm in entertainment, he started mm. telling me about some of the people in entertainment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was like, really? You know, I didn't know yeah. that they were from South Carolina. Yeah. Really? You yeah. know, everybody yeah. from, yeah. you know, yeah. Eartha yeah. Kitt and, you know, My <laughs> and yeah. all of these people, you yeah. know. And, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, exactly. and so I think it's very, it's very um, much needed that we have resources like that book, yes. you know, in order to let our younger Carolinians know yeah. The history, the, you know, yeah. and and the fact that you know you don't have to be from the big cities and and the bigger yeah. known states yeah, and things yeah, like yeah, that yeah. in order to yeah. happen. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that's just like that's just like you 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 mentioned Dizzy Gillespie, mm -hmm. and I immediately thought of Dizzy Gillespie. I think this 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 would have been in the in the 1950s late 1950s maybe the very beginning of the 60s and uh, there were a number of of jazz jazz musicians that the US State Department oh, yeah. employed yeah mm -hmm. and had them go around essentially as musical ambassadors, ambassadors yeah. for the US mm -hmm. and this was this was so important because uh, it's the time period of the Cold War mm -hmm. the US and the Soviets uh, locked in competition for international influence and racism had become uh, in terms of American foreign policy a great liability because uh, the, 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 the Soviet regime at every opportunity told uh, countries where, where the, the, the inhabitants were black, were brown, were yellow, and were emerging from colonialism. Oh, you can't listen to right. American leaders. They, they don't believe in democracy. Look at how they treat black people. You know, and, mm -hmm. so, and, so, and so people like Dizzy and others went around in an effort Lewis, to, uh, yeah, Duke yeah, Ellington, yeah, Duke Ellington yeah, yeah. Ab, ab, absolutely, mm -hmm. to demonstrate another aspect of American life for, right. for black people, not, real, not, not sweeping anything under the rug, Correct. not denying anything, right. Correct. but just showing that certain things were, were possible and um, People, a lot of people, for example, just don't know about that aspect. Mm -hmm. And they think of, of entertainers uh, as having lives that are far narrow, narrower than they actually are. Mm -hmm. And when you think of Harry Belafonte and, and um, uh, people, people of that ilk, Sidney Poitier, mm -hmm. and what they did for the civil rights movement, for right. example, mm -hmm. and, and much of that was behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I mean, some, someone had to raise all that money, put on concerts and, mm -hmm. and raise money to uh, generate bail right. for people to get out of jail after, right. after they've been uh, incarcerated for demonstrations. And so, right. so a lot of that is behind the, behind the scenes work, necessary and very important. And that's the, that's the kind of story that we'll be telling uh, right around the corner 
at the International African American Museum too. Now, see, that was gonna—I was gonna lead into that. You <laughs> okay. got, you got me. <laughs> that was gonna lead into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. With this, um, with this tremendous museum that's about to be, you know, uh, right around, literally right around the corner yeah, from yeah, this yeah, yeah. building. Um, uh, I know that you are heavily involved with that. Um, yeah. Could you tell us about uh, how all of that came about? Yeah, sure. So this is a project that's been 20 years in the making. Yeah. Um, but but I just I just realize, you know, based based on my own experience, my life, that. Um, you know, which is not to say that good things can't happen overnight. They certainly can. Mm -hmm. But I've seen so many projects and been involved in so many projects that are just long-term projects. And, and sometimes people, people, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. on the outside, they, they get skeptical and, and they say, is this thing ever going to happen, right. you know? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's been about 20 years in the making. Uh, we'll be open in 2022, which seems like to me, like saying next week, right. you that, know, that's, that's <laughs> close I mean, for something of yeah, this magnitude. Yeah, yes. yeah. And so I've, I've been working with the project most of that time period uh, and, and most of that time period as a member of the board. So I can I can remember when I, I think it was I think it was over at the aquarium and we we had one of the earliest meetings and, and there were people I don't know, 20 people, 25 people sit, sitting around the table and we were throwing out ideas about what this place ought to be like mm -hmm. and what it was going to be called and everything and, and what, what the storyline was going to be. And, you know, one of, the, one of the people who was at that meeting, someone that we just recently lost, James Campbell, mm. was, at, was mm -hmm. at that meeting. And in fact, in fact, every, everyone needs to know that Jim Campbell uh, was one of the most ardent uh, advocates uh, of the name of, of the term international. Because, you know, Jim was, he oh, had yeah. an international <laughs> vision, a world vision. Right. And, and had a world life. And so that's really where that comes from. Mm. And we are we are working to to realize the international dimension, and 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 so what it means is that, and this goes back to something that you mentioned a few moments ago, that the experience of African Americans in South Carolina is so important and so germane and central to the larger Black experience in the U.S but not just the U.S., but to the Western Hemisphere, that we can start here and build out and use it as a kind of a jumping off point by which we can understand the larger black experience around the Atlantic Rim and even in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of basic idea here. And uh, I mean, if you just think about one thing, I always use this example, although it's not a, it's not, it's, it's not completely a South Carolina example, but nevertheless, it's, it's connected here. And that is um, the Haitian Revolution between uh, 1791 uh, and 1804 uh, in the Caribbean. And, and, and during the course of that fighting and disruption and everything, uh, large numbers of people who were able to leave San Domingue, known as the, today Haiti, mm -hmm. they left and, and they came to port cities uh, around, around the Gulf, you know, all the way from <coughs> New Orleans, all the way up to Baltimore, actually. Right. And a lot of those people came to, came to Charleston. Right. And uh, so, you know, you had people of French origin who mm -hmm. vacated, they, they come here. So that's part of the Charleston connection. And also, and also, if they had, uh, if, if, if they owned slaves, they brought them with them. If they were free blacks there uh, in San Domingue, they, they fled the violence and so on. And a lot of those people came here. So there's a South Carolina connection. But to the larger U.S. experience, this is the way 
uh, by telling that story, you can understand how Thomas Jefferson was able to acquire Louisiana because once Napoleon lost Saint-Domingue, that, 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 that place was the most important part of the French Empire. Mm -hmm. And once he lost mm -hmm. it, okay. he says, well, I better sell Louisiana up in North America before the Americans take it. I mean, after all, we were right next door. Right. And a lot of people don't understand that Louisiana uh, that Napoleon owned was far larger than the state. Oh, definitely. Far it was, larger it than was the way, state. It was a yeah. lot of, he said all the way up to of, Canada. That's a lot of real estate. It's a lot of real estate. <laughs> and what it did was, when Jefferson bought it, it literally doubled the size of the U.S. Right. Doubled the size of the U.S. And so here's how black history uh, is absolutely central to understanding American history. And there's, in this case, a, a South Carolina connection because during the course of uh, the fighting in San Domingue, you had a large number of people come to Charleston as, as refugees. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can tell that story in another way, too, because in 1822, when the Denmark Vesey slave conspiracy was organized here, and Denmark Vesey, a free black who mm -hmm. had been enslaved, organizes enslaved people to rise up and strike a blow at the system of slavery. Their plans were predicated on being able to escape to Haiti. Ah. And they hoped that they would even get some assistance from, oh. from Haiti. Because Haiti was the, the only country, the only country in the world where people once enslaved rose up, cast off their shackles, and then came into the control of their own nation. That's the only time in world history that that ever happened. Mm. And then the Haitians, what the Haitians did was then they extended the opportunity for citizenship, Haitian citizenship, to any black person who would come there. Wow. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So you think of it, black people could escape from South Carolina, where they certainly were not citizens in, in any real sense, and could go to Haiti and, and have all the rights of, of citizenship there. Wow. So here's, here's another way of looking at a South Carolina connection. Yeah. International. <laughs> international, <laughs> yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that term international means something. We'll have, we'll have changing exhibits there that can focus on different aspects of the black experience from Africa to the Caribbean to Canada, for example. Uh, you know, when black people, when the British lose the American Revolution and they evacuate Charleston, they take thousands of black people with them. A lot of those people go up to Canada and they become the nuclei for black communities up in Nova Scotia, for example. Mm. So here's, here's another international connection. connection. So those, those are some of the things that people will be able to see and explore, learn about, that really uh, capitalize on our location, our unique history, and uh, will complement the other African-American uh, museums around, around the country. Mm -hmm. And then we have, we have international connections too, and we'll be sending people to the, the Barbados National Museum, for mm -hmm. example, the Maritime and the Slavery Museum in Liverpool, uh, United Kingdom. And of course, we'll send them to places around around the state and the, uh, uh, the U.S. to do Sable Museum in Chicago and, you know, that kind of thing. So, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be wonderful when we, when we get it going. Next year. That's yeah. right around the corner. Yeah, it, it, really, <laughs> it, it, really, it really is right around the corner. Right around yeah, the corner. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now, yeah. Um, uh, just to wrap things up, you are... Uh, Professor Emeritus. Yes. Um, they still keep you busy. <laughs> plenty, plenty. Listen, my listen, my colleagues over in the history department over there at the college, they have, some of them have laughed and and they have told me, 
They said, you get an F in retirement. <laughs> you get an F. <laughs> but, I, but I tell them, but I plan on getting an A. Uh -huh, that's <laughs> Just right. give me some time. That's I'm right. going to get an A. That's right. But there have been uh, so many important opportunities and projects and things to, to be done in the, the city and in the state. I've just been, it's really been a blessing to be a part of uh, these things and to try to create a, a living legacy because other, other people, other people will come along and pick up just as I've picked up on mm -hmm. some of the work uh, uh, that, you know, that others have, have done and just move it forward, do your part. And what, 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 uh, what's the expression? Nobody can do everything, but everybody, everybody can, can do, do something. something. That's right. That's, that's right. right. That's right. So that's, that's right. how I that's how I look at it. Well, Doc, we appreciate you uh, stopping by and, and chatting with us for a little while. Well, well, listen, I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you again soon. I get scared sometimes. But as I always say, it's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 70 years. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina.